Check out this building. completely caved in I'm not going in there but it's definitely a sight to see these old barns that get abandoned and they're just left to rot Grown right into the tree. Look at these monster beams, all hand hewn. Just trash everywhere. Like a horse pulled manure spreader or something, maybe. The leather bridles and other horse stuff. Check out those gears in there, those are cool.
Another caved in building. There's a saddle, still a horse saddle, up here. Body way. Right? Can you see? Yes. Saddle. Has to be another one right down there underneath it. Right down there. <sighs> kind of cool. Just vehicles with junk. House.
This is the garage I got that pedestal grinder out of. And as you can see, the roof is completely caved in. Some sort of a off-road buggy here, right next to it. No idea. You'll never guess what was uncovered when I moved it. Can you see it? I'm coming in, all I see is I look right here and I see the pestle grinder. Whatever, we made a deal on it. I'm moving everything, getting out of the way. I pull the pestle grinder out here and just barely I just see the back end of what looks to be an anvil sitting on that stump right there. I mean, it's what picking dreams are made of. I peel it back, I move everything out of the way, boom. Sitting there is a monster anvil, been there for decades, just rotting away. Because they used to have horses here, and I know that I've seen tons of horse stuff. I was told they, this is a dairy farm or something to that effect. And, man, I am excited.
There's another post vise buried in the dirt. All right, now that I got that all put back together, you can get a better uh, look at it. So, obviously, get that off that there. Obviously, this is the shaft here. 
spins. The Babbitt bearings in here are actually in very, very good shape, as you saw. This is basically would have run either by a flat belt going straight up into a line shaft, or this is a hollow casting, and so the other option, and this is probably what I'm going to try and do, is it's got this door back here. And this door, this door will allow me to maybe mount like a motor down there and then run either a flat belt or, you know, a V-belt straight down onto an electric motor, making it a self-contained unit essentially without having to be uh, line shaft driven. As of right now, I'm having a little trouble with um, this side here because if I tighten it all the way down, I'm having issues where it is too tight and it basically locks it onto the shaft. And so, so if I tighten these down, it locks it down onto the shaft, won't spin. So I'm going to have to figure out the proper way to shim these to get them so that they, uh, they don't tighten down too far on the shaft. It definitely looks like there was a switch here and maybe some, some name badges, or maybe there's another, some sort of a switch or a mount here for maybe a, you know, a, a tool rest or something. Um, but casting's in great shape. No cracks anywhere that I've found so far. Like I say, and up top here is in good, good working order. So definitely excited to bring this old beast back to life. That'll be a fun project. Here is the other post vise, or the post vise that I found. Um, it's got a five and a half inch jaw. Basically comes out to about where my finger is. And it is a beast. I don't know if there's a maker's mark on it. I haven't gotten it quite cleaned up. A lot of times they'll be on this, uh, this rear nut. Um, sometimes they put it, you know, here, but never usually up on the jaws because these they know would have gotten beat to heck. But it's got everything. I mean, it's got the spring, which is in great shape. It's got the actual beautiful mount. Um, it's free. It opens up. I mean, who knows how long it's been been just abandoned. But that'll be a, an awesome addition to the shop. My other ones are only uh, four inches. Four inch jaws. And so here we have another, this is a Nye uh, Toolworks pipe vise. Um, it's Pretty frozen up. Screw works a little bit, but um, I don't know. It was just I, I paid almost nothing for it. I think they're so cool, and I've I mean I've got like five or six of them already, and I don't need them. But I mean I just can't pass up beautiful old cast iron. Even if I don't end up using it, maybe I'll find somebody to give it to, put it in the right hand. Okay, so another thing I got on the latest pick was this really awesome. Thor drill and the trigger actually still operates um, I have no idea if it'll work or not obviously the cord is eh, we might be able to get that to work little little electrical tape all the way around it to probably fix it but so yeah this would be a cool little project it's got a couple badges here that would look really nice restored um, who knows if it'll ever operate again, but I figured I could at least get it cleaned up a little bit, use it as decoration if I can't get it to work. And then, got a couple more axes. So this is just a single bit. So I was really excited about this, this axe here, that I already wire-wheeled it and got all the rust off, put a little bit of an edge on each side. The handle itself is actually in very good shape. Um, it could probably use a sanding and maybe, you know, a coat of oil, but um, I don't know. I just love, love beautiful old axes. Then over here I've got a Wright screw hoist, model 45. Um, it says right here that it is a two-ton capacity. And it's locked up. 
it's got this basically double fall on the hook, um, the lifting hook. This chain wasn't actually on it. This is the chain that you would operate to go up and down. And I found the chain in the dirt at the same place. Um, and I was able to get it to fit in there. I haven't, th this is seized up and so it won't actually turn. So until I get around to taking it apart and getting it to work, I'm not, it won't run. So, but I just thought the look of this thing is awesome. And so, and it's a two ton capacity, it's 4,000 pounds. The one I currently use is a one ton. And so it gives me that extra capacity and it'd make an awesome restoration project that I'll probably do here on the channel. So this is some sort of a, a winch reel, I believe, for a cable or a, a big rope. You can see right here, this is part of, this is wood. And this is basically old rotten wood. This probably was part of a, um, a flat belt uh, pulley that ran probably right here between this spool, is what I would basically call it, and the actual uh, metal gear here. Um, I found it just laying on the ground at this place, and um, I, I just, I, I loved the look of this gear. Like I've said many times, I, I enjoy old gears, even if I don't end up using them for something. This could make a really cool, like, like uh, base to a chair or a stool here in the shop, um, even if it never gets put back to use as what it was, because I, clearly this is all I have of it. I don't have all the rest of the pieces, um, but... Yeah, that's why I grabbed that. So if you're at all familiar with um, the way old machinery used to be run, um, they would run it on, you know, big flat belt pulleys that were basically called line shafts that would be mounted up in the, the ceiling of buildings. And so imagine these two 6 by 6s were mounted up in a ceiling and this was up there. It has these, these are called pill, pill blocks or pillow blocks or something. Basically, they're bearings. You would bolt this to pretty much anything, really. And then the middle of it has the bearing and allows, you know, a nice smooth surface for a shaft to go through. And then this end here um, is essentially where the flat belt would ride. So a big flat belt would ride right here on this 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 pulley, this wide, usually they're very wide, many times they're wood. This one is cast iron. It looks like they took a piece of like canvas or something and uh, riveted it, it to the, the, the cast iron pulley to give it grip so that it could grab that, that flat belt. Typically the flat belts are a cloth of some kind or leather. And so unlike today's V belts that grab basically using rubber, they needed to have something on these pulleys to allow, you know, friction so that the, the pulleys or the flat belts wouldn't constantly slip. And so I believe this is more of a modern one because of the fact that it has these bearings. A lot of them didn't have such nice bearings, but it gives you the idea of what would have been run in people's, uh, in these factories or these, these shops back in the day before they had electric motors on everything. And that's the reason is that, you know, these days electric motors are on everything. And so you basically have power at the tool. Back in the day, they didn't have that. Every machine was run on some big either motor or, or a paddle wheel if you were on a river or, you know, lots of different ways to make the power. But it ran with a network of flat belts throughout the, the factory so that each machine could get its power that way. It was affordable. And for, you know, way back when they didn't have electric motors that could do this for us. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I, what this is. I'm not quite sure what I'm using it for, but I thought it was cool. I don't see them very often and I figured I'd grab it. So I also found this old fire helmet, fireman's helmet, um, that I just thought was really neat. The, you know, it's obviously just a black hard hat with a shield. A little neck protector that folds up in if you needed to not not wear it um, but I don't know I just I, I love old safety items I love things like that and I've got a whole uh, bunch of other helmets that that uh, this would look really cool with it's kind of awesome
All right, now to the personally most exciting finds of this pick, and that is these two anvils. And I just, I love anvils. I love what they, they say about tools and time. And, you know, an anvil is something that a true craftsman back in the day stood in front of. It took, it took a lot of expertise and knowledge to stand at one of these things and actually produce a living from it and, and build beautiful things. And before the Industrial Revolution, this was the way things were made. And, you know, I love new tools as well, but, but an anvil speaks to where we've come from. And I love that. And so these are my second and third anvils. Obviously, if you've seen my restoration of uh, the other anvil that I have, that's the first anvil I've ever gotten. And finding an anvil buried in the garden or abandoned in some, you know, backwoods has always been a dream of mine. And so I haven't fully achieved that yet, but when I came across these two, completely forgotten, it was something that, you know, I, I, I love it. It's what gets me out there to look. It's what, you know, it's a passion of mine. And so I'll bring you in a little closer and we'll talk about each of uh, the two anvils that I have here. All right, so this is a Peter Wright anvil. Right here it says Peter Wright Patent, England. It says solid rot here on this circle. And the numbers are 2225. And so because this is an English made anvil, it is weighted based on what's called the hundred weight system. And essentially these three numbers, it's not, it's not like it's 225 pounds or whatever, it's none of that. The first number relates to the number of 112 pound weights. So you would have this times two, or times 112. So you got two times 112 is 224. Then this middle number is one fourth of that 100 weight, which is a 28 pounds. And so you would multiply this number times one fourth of 112, which is 28. So that gives us 56. And then the third number, 25 here, cannot be any larger than 27 because it is essentially the number of pounds before you get up to the 28. So if, it, if this number was 28, it would actually be zero here and this, make this a three. And so basically it's 224 pounds plus the 56 pounds, because it's two times 28, and then plus 25 pounds, which makes this a 305 pound anvil. Um, which is not a small anvil. It is a very good size, absolutely beautiful anvil. The um, edges have some dings. The cutting table is definitely, uh, you know, swayed out. Um, it had this uh, in the hardy hole, and I'll bring in a little closer. And I'll show you uh, what having left that in there did to the hardy hole. So th this anvil was found with this. Basically, it was kind of like right there. And what happened is dirt and water and everything filled up these little gaps. And over the years, what happened is the, the hardy hole, which is this square hole here, developed um, cracks and things essentially right here along the edges. Um, and basically cracks and it, and it rusted out and pitted out. So right here, all along the edge, it slightly rusted out and kind of chipped away. Now, that's not a huge deal because the inside is plenty thick and it's still a perfect square. Um, when I do a restoration on this anvil, I will, I will build this up with hard facing rod and then, you know, file out the perfect square to get it back to where it was. Like I said, it was it was facing like this and kind of halfway in there, causing that rot problem. But the it looks like this was used large. See this little divot, little dent right there. This was largely used like this, and so that dent fits right there where this this fits on. And I I don't know if this is a cutting table in addition to the table on the front, 
or, you know, the reason I believe it's more than that is because, see how it has this, this taper here, and so the other thing this could have been used for was being able to work things around, kind of like, almost, almost like working a horseshoe, you know, something that you could get all the way around here, and I mean, obviously the horn is going to be significantly better for the horseshoe, but um, if you know what this tool was used for, what it's called, I, I'd love to know. Um, it's definitely well made, I mean, it's very, very heavy duty, it definitely looks homemade, um, but it fits the sandal perfectly, and I, I plan to hang on to it and use it for all kinds of things that it was probably never designed for. <laughs> Party hole is a looks like it's an inch and a half. Basically one and a half, well, one and three eighths. Yeah, about one and three eight eighth inch hardy hole. Um, and then it's got this, this is called the Pritchell hole, or it's used for punching. So if you had a hot piece of iron, you would take a punch here and then hit it with a hammer and then the it would allow the punch to go through the metal and not hit the anvil and so then the piece of hot metal that you punched out would just drop through and fall straight down and then you would have a hole in your metal um, that was one of the most effective ways of putting holes in metal before actual drills came into uh, into large production this Peter Wright measures 33 inches from the heel to the tip of the horn. It measures let's see here, five inches across the face, and the height is looks like 13 and three quarters from the bottom to the top of the face. So. Yeah, definitely a good size anvil. Well, I haven't done any work on this anvil at all, and so... I think once I get a lot of the rust cleaned up and get some of the pitting out of the face here, the uh, that ring will come back significantly. Now, this is a solid wrought anvil, and I believe there's a hardened face that was forge welded onto it um, in the factory, but it still has a very, very good ring. Um, the rebound is not the greatest, and I believe that to be due to the, due to the pitting in the, in the face. See, right there, kind of a little bit, I think it hits a, hits like a, a, a hole and just kind of deadens it. But we will see if that changes with the restoration of this anvil. See, because it really depends on where you hit it. If you drop it in just the right spot, it's got fairly decent ant or return. Now, I'm no anvil expert by any means, I'm just a dude with some tools, but, um, so if you've got any better ways of bringing back, I don't believe that the face on this anvil has delaminated. Um, the, the lines are actually fairly crisp across the whole anvil. As far as that edge goes, I mean, there's a ding here, a couple dings here. Um, there are some... Some pretty decent chunks of rust that are on the face of this. I haven't done anything to it at all, but my plan is to build up this edge, build up any edging. I'm probably going to build up the cutting table here, build up around this hardy hole, and then just clean the surface flat um, and get it down to bare metal so I can get it usable again. And that's, that's really the goal here. The goal is not to make this a showpiece. I want to use this bad boy. So, so that's the Peter Wright.
So this is the other anvil that I came across and I had no idea what size it was or who made it, but it turns out to be, it says Trenton here. Right there, they've got that very distinct diamond logo. And so the Trenton is a US manufactured anvil that was, they're very, very, they made very, very good anvils. Now this particular one is marked, is marked K157. So from what I know, K was the first letter of the last name of the, um, the craftsman who built this anvil. So whoever Mr. K was is the one that made this particular anvil. And because this is an American-made anvil, it's not done on a 100-weight system. It's basically they punched the weight. So this is a 157-pound anvil. And then here, I believe that this, I believe that this is the serial number. So this, I believe, is A83282. And so if you know any more information on Trenton's and are able to help me date this or find out who, uh, who, Mr. K is, I would absolutely love to know. Um, and I haven't done a whole lot of research into it other than to find out, you know, its weight rating um, and to know that this is a serial number. So the other crazy thing about this Trenton is that, you know, so basically this top surface is called the face. And then right about here is where the face should end. And then you have the cutting table and the horn. And um, this face has been ground back and it's got this radius, which makes me believe, you know, a, an angle grinder or a, a, a big disc grinder of some sort, ground it back. But then there's all these tool marks in that. And so I don't know if this particular anvil is made of tool steel more than just this top surface plate. I don't know if this delaminated and they ground it back to try and get to usable metal, not knowing that maybe the lower portion was wrought iron or, you know, not actual same hardness as the top. I, I really have no idea. And so my plan will be to restore this is basically to take hard facing rod, build up this entire area that's missing and basically all the way up to the cutting table and then fill in, you know, so there's some, uh, some chips here on the edges, fill those in. Now that I look at it, you can see the seam right here where the hardened face was originally forge welded onto the lower body. So that, that right there leads me to believe that more than likely this part of the anvil's face delaminated and they ground it off trying to get to usable uh, workable metal. Um, but I know it looks rough now, but a little love and this little guy can definitely be a great usable anvil here at the at the workshop. Now in regards to like the uh, the rebound on this one, Definitely still a beautiful ring. And we'll do. So, I mean, it's definitely not perfect, especially there. But I think it will serve me well. And I'm excited to get it all fixed up and in working condition again. So this anvil measures 28 inches from heel to toe, or heel to the tip of the horn. It measures, let's see here, four inches across the face. And it is a whopping 10 and a half inches tall. And so definitely a good-sized all-around anvil.
The hardy on this Trenton anvil looks to be about a one inch hardy hole. So I also got this Enco nickel powder, 300 pounds, product of Canada barrel that has basically blown out the bottom. I mean, it's still decent metal, but it's just kind of all warped. But really, I just used it. I, got, I found all these. So there's, I don't know, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight of these bins. Here in the workshop, I can never have enough bins like these. I'm, I use them all the time in drawers or on the bench, like literally right here behind you stuff that I use commonly, stuff to grab quickly. Um, and so I, I grabbed those because I know I can put those to good use. This hammerhead or whatever, I mean, I think it's a hammerhead. Some sort of a pick maybe. Didn't have a handle. I just thought it was pretty unique. So might, if you know exactly what kind of hammer this is, definitely let me know. Got another ax head. No idea who made it, but that's cool. I like pulleys. And so I got this snatch block here. Um, it's it's this is what you would undo to get the to swivel this open so you could get the cable or rope onto the pulley. It says um, um, 3.5 tons, and then it's 12:21.72. So I don't know if that's it was made December 21st, 1972. Uh, Definitely looks like a homemade badge of some kind. Doesn't have any other markings. But it looks to be well made. I mean, it's a it's a nice snatch block. So uh, I'll probably clean that up and make sure I don't make sure to look for cracks and everything. If it looks good, I'll probably just use it. Another little little pulley. Love these old decorative ones. Um, so that's why I have that one. And this is a cool one. This is a, a wooden block and tackle or pulley. And basically, it allows for quick removal of the, the line, the rope or the wire. Um, and honestly, it's probably always rope because this is wood. But um, I don't have one that has this, this quick removal disconnect like that. And so, another cool decoration for the shop. Another little little S wrench. I like these. Then I found some smelting stuff. So I've got these are a couple of ladles, and this is a. I'm pretty sure that you would dip down into like a, a pot of lead and be able to use it, um, like lead roofing and whatnot. Copper roofing, basically, uh, they used to um, solder them by, I think these are the bases. I think it works like this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you would have like a little fire or a pot or something like that, and you would basically put this over the top of it. You would put your your uh, solid metal in here. It would melt it. This would allow you to grab it, usually with like tongs or something, take it wherever you wanted, and then you would ladle out what you wanted and pour it. And so these are a few different sizes, and I don't know if maybe they built up to a certain something, they don't look like it, but these bases or whatever these are, there's a few of those, and then there's a bunch of these pots. So there's a there's the largest of them. Um, this one here was definitely cut to make this a pour spout, to make it easier to pour out of. Um, that one's got a big crack in it, I just noticed. But these other little ones, they're pretty thin walled ones. This is a really thick walled crucible almost. And so I plan to do some, some uh, basically brass and aluminum castings, and so I may try and use these as crucibles and see how well they work. So that's what I got there. Last and definitely least is what you see in front of you. So we've got a bunch of horseshoes. These are all used horseshoes. Um, I didn't really care. I figured I'd grab them and might be able to make something out of them. I'll put them. I've got a bunch of other ones too. I'll just put them in my pile with them, and they can come in handy whenever I need them for like a decoration project or something. This, I believe, is a a clamp 
drill of sorts. This bar clamp essentially um, can adjust. It's frozen solid, but, and then this would have had a handle right here, like a wooden handle on a screw. And you would basically crank this, or you could turn this and basically loosen or tighten, whatever. I, I don't exactly know how it works, but it does have a square hole right here. And so this would have this would have been used more than likely on like drilling holes in beams. You would basically take it up to the beam and the screw pressure would then hand crank the drill into the wood. Um, I don't know if there's a maker's name on it. I think it says patent March something and then there's some numbers here. It looks like 1890. Um, let's uh Grab a water brush here. See if we can. So it says patent March 1890, and then this square thing here is the bolt that is holding this onto the the bar itself. Um, so. I don't see a maker's name on it anywhere. If you know exactly what kind of drill this is or what it's called, it doesn't look like a post drill, um, but I thought it was kind of neat and unique, so um, I grabbed it. Maybe it's not unique, maybe it's just neat. But, so yeah, that's that. So I've got these, this, uh, it, it basically, it says it's a drill index, but when I, I thought it was drills when I grabbed it, but, when I opened it, it's a letter. It's missing a whole bunch of the smaller ones. It's missing one of the bigger ones. But it's a letter, basically, I thought that they were transfer punches because if you look at the tip there, it's got basically a, a little center tip. But correct me if I'm wrong, transfer punches don't have the same thing on both sides. And so this basically has a center on each side of it because if, you, if it was a transfer punch, you'd be hitting it with a hammer to transfer that, that hole, that dimple, into the metal. Um, I don't know for sure. I mean, are these just gauge pins of some kind to be able to reference, you know, uh, in, in machining to make sure you get the right size? If you know exactly what these are, let me know. They're in actually fairly good shape. I mean, there's a little surface rust on a few of them, but uh, nothing that won't clean up well. Now, obviously, I'm missing B to K and then W, but the rest of them are here. So that's pretty much everything. All right, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Rescuing Old Iron. And we've definitely got a lot more excursions planned. I've got a big one coming up where I'm gonna be potentially getting a whole bunch of old engine lathes, big mill. So if you're interested in an old engine lathe from around the turn of the century, I might have some available here soon. So I'd really appreciate you getting hold of me. My email is in the about section on the YouTube page. Um, but we found these old anvils, obviously, as you saw. And if you haven't already seen this screw ho hoist restoration video on this channel, go check that out. Lots more planned, so have a good one, and get out there and rescue something today. Take it easy.